Hi, my name is Lois Wessel. I'm the Associate Director for Programs at the Association of Clinicians. ACU is the national nonprofit organization whose mission is to improve the health of underserved populations by working with people like you, the clinicians who day in and day out are in federally qualified health centers and other community health settings who are serving a diverse patient population. We know that with this population, there are many challenges and many benefits to learning how to communicate well with your clinics. And today, I'm going to talk about some of the tools that healthcare and social service providers can implement individually, as well as things that can be implemented on the organizational level to improve communications with clients. We know that improving communications with the clients in your practice setting is beneficial to them because of improved outcomes as well as being beneficial to you because there's nothing more satisfying than feeling like you're being heard and you're being understood. And there's nothing more disappointing than feeling like all the resources that you have to offer a patient, all the patient education, and all the ideas that you have to help them improve their health care and stay healthy is not understood because of language barriers or issues regarding low health living. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is how language, culture, and communication affect people's access to services and appropriate use of community resources. Because if somebody doesn't understand, we don't want them to keep coming back and back again trying to get the same information. If we, the health system, don't have the resources to help them, they may not be able to help themselves and they may be poorly using resources numerous times. One example of this might be a girl, I like to call this little girl Rosita, it's a fictional child, but she's like so many of the children I see in my patient practice. For many years, she had poorly controlled asthma. She was being seen in emergency departments, in different clinics, in clinics in a target setting, um, and she got different medications and different prescriptions and different instructions, but she never really understood that she had a chronic disease. Her mother didn't understand the importance of the steroid inhaler that she needed to be on daily as opposed to the albuterol inhaler, which was just when she needed it. Fortunately, Rosita ended up in the hospital with an acute exacerbation of asthma, something that could have been avoided had the information been presented to her in a way that she understood and her family understood. So often there's just confusion about how to best take care of the patients we see, and that may result into poor use of services. Another example of this, something that I like to think about that I read in the, my local paper, the Washington Post one time, and it was a very highly educated mother who was a lawyer and she had her first child and the child was sick and she called the pediatrician and reported that the baby had a fever and the pediatrician said, well, how are you taking it? And she said, oh, this is terrible. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And the pediatrician said, no, how are you taking the temperature? And so these two highly educated people who were speaking their same language had a confusion over something as simple as how are you taking the temperature? And so it's understandable to think that when we're working with the patient population with diverse cultural backgrounds and linguistic needs, that there may be a lot of room for confusion. And it's not just our poor, low-income patients who may be like this, but elderly, anyone with chronic disease, that's so much information to absorb at once. Um, immigrants, like this highly educated mother, new parents tend to be somebody, people who are very overwhelmed with information. And anybody who is new to a disease. So regardless of your patient population, there are things that usually we can do to improve communication. Something that's really important to remember is to take a step back. and Remember, we just see the surface or we see the tip of the iceberg. We may see how they're dressed or if they're male or female or young or old. We see the physical characteristics and maybe we get a sense of their educational level by the way they present their um, their discussion to us about why they're here. But we don't see many of the things that are behind them. Maybe they had somebody in their family who died of a disease and they're afraid they have it. I had a patient once who I went in to talk to him about his high cholesterol and what he could do, and unbeknownst to me, even though he was an African immigrant, he had a PhD in molecular biology from a university in Paris, and he knew much more about cholesterol on the cellular level than I knew, and I went in there trying to explain things to him very basically, and he understood a great deal more. So we just don't know. And, and they may see something that we don't know about ourselves. I'm a nurse practitioner and I often get the si doctora uh, because I speak Spanish and I explain to them I'm a nurse practitioner. To them their perception of me is I am um, their doctor even though I always say that I'm their nurse practitioner and I can provide their primary care but I'm not a physician. Um, similarly I had a patient recently who told me she'd seen me in the neighborhood walking with 
my two little grandchildren. And I told her that I don't have grandchildren, that I have two uh, young daughters. And I think it was a cultural situation where in my community at my age, it's appropriate to have school age and middle school children. Whereas in her community at my age, I would be, as she thought I was, an abuelita or a grandmother. So we may see things differently. And clients bring so much baggage with them, and I don't mean negative baggage, but they bring their whole history with them that you're just getting a slice of. So maybe their family's belief system and history about the medical system. Suppose they had somebody in their family who went to a clinic once and got um, very sick and subsequently died and may make them fearful of the clinic. Um, the community may say, that is a really good clinic. They were a really nice to you there. So they may go with a positive feeling about the clinic. I live in Washington, D.C., as I mentioned, and on my way to do this session today, I heard a radio show about informed consent, and they were talking about the famous Tuskegee syphilis experiment. And I remembered back when I was in nurse practitioner school and doing training at a clinic in D.C., how many of the patients did not want to get um, a flu shot or any immunizations because the, their knowledge of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, where, where people were not getting treated with syphilis, was still fresh in their minds, even though it had happened decades ago. So people bring whatever the community thinks about the healthcare system. They may be refugees out of a terrible political situation in their country. They may come from a country where healthcare is free and everybody gets it, and they don't understand that, that if you don't have money here, it's harder to access healthcare. Well, we'll talk a lot more about issues of language and literacy that they bring to their visit in a few minutes. They also bring their economic situation where they're concerned if they need any testing or medications, that they might have to make a choice between buying a medication or putting food on the table. They may not understand, and I don't blame them because I don't always understand, um, how our healthcare system works and that you need referrals to get to the next level and that you sometimes need to be on a waiting list for certain things if you're uninsured and you need, you can't just go get an x-ray, you need to have an order um, from a clinic, from a primary care provider. So that may be part of their confusion. They may bring their spirituality and their religion with them. I know in my patient population, a lot of people believe something will happen if God wants it to happen. That's their personal uh, feeling around healthcare. So it's not so much what they do, it's what God wants to happen to them. And sometimes we have to work with that and say, God helped give us these medications so that you could get better. Um, and I've touched before on their insurance status. So that's something that they definitely bring. And sometimes we think about what, what patients bring as being something that's thick, that's in all parts of their life. They're always going to be female. They're always going to be African. They're always going to be um, a mom. And some of it, it may be thin, and they may have it just at certain times. So I know um, when um, some people may have certain things that compartmentalize. I have a colleague who is a devout Muslim, but she doesn't look Muslim when she comes to work in the sense that she doesn't cover up and she doesn't, we don't note any particular particular dietary customs. Um, so those are things that she she's very much blended in with the system. And so when you see somebody, you don't know what their political beliefs are, their religious beliefs, their beliefs about the health system, their dietary beliefs. And those are things that we don't see on the surface. We also know that everybody, regardless of your level of understanding of medicine and your training in medicine or, or not, has certain health beliefs. Um, some of my patients use... Um, Savila or aloe, they, they mix it up uh, in the blender and they drink it for certain ailments. Um, and it has been scientifically proven that aloe is good for the skin. Um, in my Jewish culture, it's chicken soup and chicken soup for the soul. Um, and there's been some research on, on whether it's the, the liquid that's good for a cold or something in the chicken. But we all bring something with us that um, is part of our cultural belief around health. If somebody thinks that pills don't do any good, it doesn't matter how many pills we're going to give them. If they think that um, acupuncture may help them, then in fact it, very, it may very much help them. So what I'm trying to say here is that things are multi-layered. And people bring a variety of experiences and beliefs and histories when they come in. So it's their internal factors such as um, their nationality, their religion, how much they're acculturated into our society, their class, um, language, literacy, their family makeup. Um, their perception of how much time it takes to do anything. I know patients sometimes are irritated how much time they, they spend waiting in the waiting room. Other patients say, wow, you were so quick, because maybe at the other clinic they were at, they had to wait even longer. 
it may be many issues of their sexual orientation, their political, religious views, and things that we don't always see on the surface, as well as the way the system is affecting them externally, um, biases that they may have felt towards themselves, they may be fearful of access to people. Many of my patients are undocumented Hispanic and African immigrants, and they may be fearful that we would be telling immigration services about them. We've probably faced racism and discrimination um, and many other things that affect how they're going to hear what you're going to say. And on top of that, when we're dealing with patients with limited English proficiency, it's really important to understand that um, a person may be speaking to you in English and their English may be sufficient that you can get a little bit of a history, but it may not be quite at the level to understand the specifics of taking a medication twice a day. For example, today, just this morning in my clinic, I saw an African patient who I put on a common antibiotic um, that needs to be taken uh, double dose the first day and then for four subsequent days, just one dose. And we had to get the language line, and I'll talk about that in a little bit because I want to make sure she understood how to take her medicine. So her per even though her English was sufficient to do some of the history for the medication management, I didn't think it was. We know that a person who is unable to speak, read, or write English at a level that um, allows them to interact effectively with the world around them, such as social service providers and healthcare providers, has what we call limited English proficiency. And I want to say that that, like so many other things, is on a continuum. Just because they don't speak English as a first language doesn't mean they won't speak English later on, so they may be in the process of learning English. We know that 80% of the hospitals in this country treat patients daily with limited English proficiency, um, and so that's 8 out of 10 hospitals see at least one patient who treats somebody daily who doesn't speak English. We'll talk a little bit more about the legislation around this later. What I wanted to depict in this cartoon that if somebody's sick and they go to the healthcare provider, and the healthcare provider says what in their mind is blah, 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 but they know have to say, yes, I understand. When they get home, they might not be able to share what they learned with their family members. And so it's sort of a missed visit or a lost visit. The patient isn't getting better. And as I touched on earlier, it is um, unsatisfying for the provider. Um, there have been cases of malpractice suits where people haven't had a trained medical interpreter um, to help um, facilitate the conversation. We'll get back to that later. On top of that, we have the issue of low health literacy. Um, the, in 2003, the National Assessment of Adult Literacy uh, did a study that looked specifically at health literacy in our country. And they found that 14% of Americans functioned below the basic level. That means they couldn't uh, read uh, appointment slips and medication information. Only 22% functioned at the basic level. Um, so combined, that's 36% of the population that didn't have good enough skills to understand some of the medical information that they received. And again, I understand that. I look at the inserts, and even being a nurse practitioner, the inserts and in some of the medications are very confusing to me. Um, there's something that I've um, talked about in some of the other trainings I've done, which was an insert that came in an asthma inhaler, and it said the number of puffs contained in your meter dose inhaler is printed on the side of the canister. After you've used that number of puffs, you must throw away your MDI, even if it continues to spray. If you use an MDI every day to control your asthma, you can determine how long it will last by dividing the total number of puffs by the total times you use it every day. For example, if your MDI has 200 puffs, you can use four puffs per day, and on and on and on. And that to me sounds like a math problem my kids have in school, not something that my patients would understand. Um, so we really need to think about the kinds of things people are getting. The New England Journal of Medicine reports that all of half of medications are been taken incorrectly. And the Institute of Medicine says there's 1.5 million preventable adverse reactions to medications that are taken poorly or incorrectly every year. Um, so with respect to thinking about low health literacy and people don't have the skills to understand medication labels and forms um, combined with limited English proficiency, I'd like to talk about the federal civil rights legislation and how it pertains to consumers with limited English proficiency. Because it's important for people in the clinic to know that there is legislation that stands behind uh, the right to have a medical um, interpreter. 
Um, the civil rights legislation is not anything new. It was it's uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it was reinforced by President Clinton um, in 2000. And it mandates compliance for agencies re receiving federal funds. Well, what does that mean? It means that anybody who is using federal funds to serve people of diverse nationalities needs to provide um, information in a language and at a level that people can understand. Um, language proficiency is considered related to national origin because people come from so many different countries, they bring their language with them, and any organization that receives federal funding is supposed to provide that information in a language that people can understand. Now we know that this is something that's being debated hotly right now with immigration politics, but it's important to know that all public and private entities receiving federal assistance, which includes state, county, local, uh, health departments and welfare agencies, um, hospitals because they get Medicaid and Medicare reimbursements, they run residency training programs, they do research with federal dollars, they have to abide by this. Managed care organizations, nursing homes, um, any recipient of um, health and human service assistance um, needs to abide by this. Uh, Medicare Part B physicians, for some reason, are exempt from this. So what does that really mean um, in terms of your clinic? There's a legal mandate that we need to provide interpreter services, but many times clinics don't have the money or the ability or the understanding of how to provide this. And this is where clinics need to work with other social, surgeons, social service agencies to pull together to have access to language lines, which are fabulous and have all sorts of languages. Um, I've never had a language that was not accessible on language lines at their fingertips to have um, interpretation in the rooms. And there are other things that can be done that we'll talk about in a few minutes. It's very important for people to know that the Department of Health and Services has guidelines that talks about uh, Title VI, um, and providing care. Um, this is a document that's used to facilitate understanding of this complex civil rights legislation. And this is something that all clinics should have access to and is accessible on the web, which talks about what you need to have given the frequency with which you encounter patients with limited English proficiency, how important your services are, what resources you need to have available. Um, so one of the resources I would like to suggest that you all look at is to go to healthandhumanservices.gov on their LEP or Limited English Proficiency website, as well as www.lep.gov. And um, in connection with that, um, there's something called the CLASS standards, which are culturally and linguistically appropriate services, CLASS standards, which are directed at healthcare organizations to help um, implement uh, guidelines on how to provide culturally competent care and language access across the whole organization. So not just in the clinic room with a phone interpretation service, but from the front desk when you walk in with, with the staff, training that's available for staff. Um, these are directed at healthcare organizations, and there are many different levels of the, of the class standards. There's, there's different standards. I believe there's 14 standards. And um, one of them, standard four, is for healthcare organizations, and it says they must offer and provide language services, including bilingual staff and interpreter services, at no cost to patients or consumers with limited English proficiency in a timely manner during all hours of operation. So that's um, to say that there, there's a support to in, um, from the government to understand why we need to put uh, these language services into place. Um, so, in fact, it's not sufficient, and I see this all the time when people say, oh, you can bring in a family member or your son can interpret, and we'll talk about some of that in a few minutes, but there are many reasons why that may not be appropriate. The other thing I think we need to uh, remember is that there may be many additional pieces of legislation on the state level. Um, in California, the Board of Pharmacy issued guidelines on patient-centered care, which look at medication labeling went into effect this year, and that was they had to take into account issues of health literacy um, in, in printing out medication labels. And the Office of Civil Rights uh, had a settlement with Medco, which is the largest online uh, pharmacy company, uh, to improve their labeling because of some adverse reactions to medication that was taken incorrectly. In the state of Washington, 
in order for pharmacists to get their pharmacy licenses renewed, um, they need to do some continuing education on language access. New York State is doing a great deal around language access for pharmacists. So this is something that we need to see. I talked about the fact that we have a very diverse patient population from many countries um, with many different needs, and they bring uh, their whole interesting lives with them into the clinic, and that they come in often with limited English proficiency and low health literacy. So I want to talk about what you can do in your organization to make things better for them. As I've said numerous times, it'll make things better for you, too. You'll feel better about the care that you're giving and be more satisfied. Things we need to look at is where are our clinics located? Are they metro accessible or are they accessible to people um, on public transportation? Um, how welcoming is our front desk? There's nothing more terrible than to go into a clinic and say, oh, I need to see a clinician. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? Speak English. Um, are our front desk sympathetic to people who come in? who may bring many needs with them and not be able to communicate. Um, same with the forms. We've all filled out dozens and dozens of forms and signed our name. And in fact, I sometimes go to a clinic and I don't understand the forms that I'm filling out. Do our, are our forms user friendly? And if not, do we have staff members who can help walk patients through their forms? Because if they fill out their forms poorly and then they get to see me and that medical history part is not filled out very well, I have to help them with it. Um, and so doing that work on the front is often better. Um, are there interpretation services? We talked about that. Is there a literacy level of our materials that people understand? And I like this photograph because it says, please name, please leave your named urine here. Um, and this is a true story where a patient came out of the room, bathroom and saying that, I didn't know what name I was supposed to put on it, so I just put John because I was in the John. Um, this patient didn't understand that he was supposed to put his name on the urine and leave it there. Um, and these are the kind of things that are confusing to patients the whole time. The other things we do is we, we love to give directions. Oh, go to the lab and get this done. Go get your x-ray here. Go see the specialist here. But again, are we giving directions in a way that people can understand? I had a patient in a former job that I had, which was a mobile van that provided care to the uninsured, who had some diabetic retinopathy and had lost several of his toes. And we sent him to a podiatrist who was willing to see him for free, and he couldn't read numbers. And he walked up and down the street that the podiatry clinic was on and didn't ever find it and missed that appointment. And subsequently, we were able to find a picture of the clinic on Google Docs and on Google Maps and print out a picture so that he could recognize the building. So one of the really easy things to do is to put yourself in their shoes and just walk in the building as if you were going to be a patient. There are many ways to do this. One of them is to get a group of people to walk through and, and just see how it feels. What does it look like? Do the pictures in the waiting room look like your patients? Um, is the educational material up on the wall something that, that they you think they can understand? And just go through the same way you go through your house and see what needs to be cleaned or what needs to be fixed. You go through the clinic, um, and this can be an exercise. It can be fun. You can do it in groups. You can do it in teams and people. Some people have little sticky notes, and the red team goes, and they put red sticky notes in areas that need to be fixed, and the blue team does, and um, and then talk about what are the things that are, are the biggest priority, and how are we going to fix them. Um, and it's often starting with the maps on how we get to our clinics. Um, there's a hospital in Washington, D.C., where you walk in, and somebody greets you. This is Washington Hospital Center, and says, where are you going? And you say, oh, I'm going for my appointment with Dr. Jones, or I'm going for my colonoscopy, and they say, you need to follow the red trail or the blue trail. And there's little trails along the road in the, inside uh, along the floor that you can follow to get to where you need to go. Um, some places are as confusing as this map, but then it may be necessary to have um, to meet patients at a certain area and have patient advocates who can help facilitate them getting to their building they need to go to. Because nothing is worse than having somebody um, go for an appointment and not be seen because they can't find the actual building. And again, I think we need to think about what our signs are saying. This Dr. Clark Center for Weight Loss Success, we are expanding, sends a mixed message, although probably most of us can laugh about it and understand what it means. But there was a sign up in a hospital um, in my community that said um, there was a little kind of basket, um, and it was said, please leave your urine. Um, I think they want to say in the basket, but they used the word crib as in a baby crib. This was in Spanish. 
um, and it sounded like, please leave your urine in the crib, so that was confusing. So we need to make sure our signs are not too confusing. And as much as I want to have nice pictures up in terms of patient education, we need to look at the kinds of pictures we're putting up. And when you look at this, bringing up your baby, we have the weight, and we have their uh, physical development, and their social and emotional development, and how long they should be napping, and their cognitive development, all on one poster. And for people with limited English skills, looking at all that, and limited literacy skills, that's overwhelming. The other thing that strikes me is there's this very cute, chubby, um, white baby on there. Um, and it's not to say that we can never have any pictures of, of anybody um, that's white, but does this picture reflect the population that you're serving? So looking for pictures that have um, patients that look like the patients you're serving is a very welcoming thing to do. Another thing to do, with, there's a lot of self-assessment tools on being culturally competent and becoming more culturally competent on this continuum. But something that's often um, interesting to have people reflect on is to, if you have a lot of bilingual staff in any language, have the staff try to conduct an interview um, in their native language with you, uh, a mock um, patient scenario where you don't speak their language, just so you have an idea of what it's like to be the person who doesn't understand what's going on. Um, and sometimes that's enlightening to people so that they can get a sense of what kinds of things their patients are facing. Um, there are numerous fabulous assessment tools available for free on the internet. Um, it's not one size fits all, but these are some of my favorite ones. The National Center for Cultural Competence has an excellent self-assessment tools tool, the Cross-Cultural Health Program, um, HRSA, um, the Health Resources Services Administration has great things. The American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association, uh, because they know so well how hard it is um, to understand what's going on when you're coming from a community of um, deaf and people with other speech problems, or additionally, who have speech problems. ARC um, has a new thing on their website, which is called Questions on the Answers, which tries to empower patients to understand that they can come in and ask questions as well. Um, and Think Culture Health is talks about the class standards on the Health and Human Services website. Um, so it's important to put these tools that are out there into practice. And I hear a lot of people say, wow, I really want to do an assessment on my staff. Where should I start? You know, can somebody come in and do a training with them? Often it's free and easy to start. And if this could be part of the annual review, that as part of your annual review and your work, you have to do a cultural assessment tool that's on the internet, it helps the workforce maintain an idea of what are the issues out there. Um, and it ensures for a well-trained and competent workforce. Um, and we know that workforce development and retention is very important. And the more people feel like the needs of their patients are being met and that they're getting the tools to serve the patients, the more happy they will be in the job to help the patients. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how you can create some consumer-friendly environments that address these issues of language, culture, and literacy. And I think it's a process that needs to happen on the organizational level as well as the individual level. And in terms of the individual level, we all like to say, um, I gave patient education materials and the patient knows now how to eat right for their high cholesterol. But are we really looking at it and making sure that it's at a level they understand? There's a piece that I picked up in a clinic recently that said, um, understanding hypotriglyceremia. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a pretty big word. I don't know if my patients could understand what that word meant, as opposed to something that talks about the amount of, of fat in your blood and the starches that you're eating, the examples of one of the starches and how it might raise your um, levels in your blood, which may cause uh, diabetes and other problems, and then explain that diabetes is sugar in your blood. And our organization, the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, has some resources on our website at Low Literacy Diabetes Education. So as clinicians, I urge you to make sure that the information you're giving out to patients is something they understand. But I also think we need to look at the culture of the organization. And perhaps in India, where this first picture was taken, it's completely acceptable for the nurses to come in and they expect the nurses to be wearing these cute little white dresses and white hats, and that's the person who's going to take care of their baby. That's not something that we see in our organizations here very much. 
but it's completely acceptable to have somebody come in with a computer who's taking care of your child. Maybe in India that wouldn't be the case. So we realize that each environment in health is very different. And we need to think about what our environments look like, how friendly and warm are they when we come in. I know when I've been to acupuncturists and massage therapists, they have water features and nice smells in the waiting room, um, and it's quiet and calming. So we need to think about how everything looks from the waiting room to the exam room. And it's an organizational commitment with the organization being like the sun, being the center um, of, a, of a universe, whereas if that sun is shining brightly, then everything else um, gets the support that it needs. There's many of things in the organization that need to flow together. Does the organization have a philosophy and a commitment to improve communication? Is that in the mission statement? Uh, if clinics are talking about becoming patient-centered medical homes, are they talking about communication and communicating with the patients, improved communication? Are there policies, structures, and procedures that reflect this? For example, a policy around use of medical interpreters, a policy around not using family members of interpreter, as interpreters. Um, is the staff diverse, reflecting the patient population? Is the staff knowledgeable about cultural practices in the community? Are there resources, which usually mean financial resources, dedicated to communication? And one simple one is having access to phones with a speaker where you can utilize language learning. Are, is there community involvement uh, through community health workers, health promoters, uh, peer educators, or advocates? Because an organization that brings in the community, if you think back to an earlier slide I had, um, creates a favorable opinion uh, by the community of the clinic. So how is the community involved? Is the community involved in helping decorate the clinic? Is the community involved in helping um, come in to do a session on health beliefs in a certain uh, population. Um, and we have to remember that communities are always changing. Um, I know that one of the areas I used to work, um, the organization was called CASA because it was to serve the Central American community. But as time uh, went on, we saw many more immigrants from Eastern Europe and subsequently from um, Western Africa. And so what started out to be a CASA for, or a home for Hispanic immigrants has now become a much larger immigrant home. So is the organization able to expand to meet the diverse and changing needs of a community? One of the examples in terms of policies and procedures I wanted to give is from an organization I used to work for. Um, and this was a policy and procedure around linguistic competence around dealing with patients with And it says mobile med serves a diverse population patients who speak a language other than English at home. And on and on to say there are several ways which interpretation services are provided. And it would go on to say that the there would be every effort made to match a patient with a provider who spoke the same language, um, that trained medical interpreters would be used, and that we would also use language line. Um, so this was a policy and procedure that was put into place to deal with this issue of linguistic competence dedicated to personnel, and there were resources dedicated as well, so that the staff would be aware what to do in case they were um, working with a patient with limited English proficiency. Many communities have something up when they come in, when a patient comes in, so you can point to the language you want can, to speak so that they can get an interpreter um, in your language. And this is key because sometimes somebody may come in and the fact of the matter is we don't know what language they're speaking. I acknowledge that being able to point to a language that you speak um, also involves being able to read that language. So there may be some additional barriers here. Um, but something as simple as this, these I speak cards or I speak posters um, in the waiting room are very helpful. And again, welcoming to patients because it allows them to know that you have resources. Um, in terms of appropriate interpreter services, um, it's very important that people are not being asked to bring in family members. I've seen children come in and interpret during gynecological examinations where you might be screaming about sexual practices and domestic violence, and a child may not have the language ability in their own language to be able to uh, interpret some of these words. Interpretation is a highly trained skill, and just because you speak the language doesn't mean you know how to interpret effectively. 
the things that are important to realize is that the provider needs to look and talk directly to the patient and not develop a rate direct relationship with the interpreter by looking over the patient or around the patient. So there are ways that the room can be set up so that you are looking directly at the patient and acknowledge the patient. Instead of saying, interpreter, tell me why he's here today, you look at the patient directly and say, tell me why you're here today. The interpreter will repeat those same words. The, um, there's a lot of work being done on the importance of trained medical interpreters. And there are, and certification of these interpreters. Because how am I supposed to know as a clinician if I'm giving information to a patient and being interpreted into a language without a level of certification? I don't know if that information is being interpreted correctly. And there may be a confusion among little things like five milliliters versus five teaspoons or five teaspoons versus five tablespoons. Um, and those are the kind of things that we don't want to have. So using trained interpreters and preferably certified interpreters is key. Um, and the National Health Law Center um, has great information, a spin-off organization of theirs, which is the Center for Healthcare Interpretation, um, or the Commission for Healthcare Interpretation, CCHI. They have great information on taking the Um, so having services available in a language people understand is key. Training your staff on how to use a medical interpreter, it's like anything else. Just because you're a clinician doesn't mean you know how to use an interpreter. Just because you're a clinician, you might need to learn how to use the new blood pressure cuff. So clinicians need to be constantly trained and retrained. Signs, posters, brochures should be culturally and linguistically appropriate, as well as information from the um, health education materials, as I discussed um, earlier. Um, and if this starts from the minute somebody calls on the phone to when they walk in the door, forms that they fill out, um, information that we give back to them. One of the very challenging ones is informed consent. But I have seen some very low literacy informed consent documents. Um, and again, use of community partners to help understand how to bridge this community gap between languages in this gap where people may, uh, we may not know how to best serve a certain population. So bringing somebody in from the community to talk about the community is key. Um, we may need to modify our approaches to intake protocols, to disseminating information, um, to how we provide health education. Many people prefer to have education in groups. And so if you only have one, for example, in a clinic I worked at, one Amharic speaking uh, provider, instead of bringing in all of your diabetics and using language line time after time, you can bring in all of your diabetics to one visit and do a group visit and have your own heart clinician provide some education around diabetes, what you should eat and how you should take your medication. And then those clinic visits may be shorter and use less time on language line, which may not be a good service. It's important to make sure that the staff is diverse and that we recruit from the community and that the staff Issues of cultural competency and use of language interpreters and communicating with patients are looked at at performance review. Often we look at how many of your patients were sent to get a flu shot or got their cholesterol tested or if they're diabetic, um, got their hemoglobin A1C. But we need to, in the annual report, also look at part of the performance review. How are you at dealing with a multicultural population? Are there issues that you need help on? Are there issues where you feel like you could use help or that you feel like you're you're confused. One example may be if you're working with a Muslim population where the women come in with a headdress on and their necks are covered. How are we going to do a thyroid exam? Um, so taking time in a clinic situation to do uh, staff trainings on the population is very key, as well as having the self-assessment tools that I mentioned before. Um, and so some of the ways that you can do this that's cheaply, because when it comes down to it, the clinic administrators always want to know, how much is this going to cost me? One thing is very simple. Instead of just guessing if people have low health literacy, and I know I've kind of gone back and forth between low health literacy and limited English proficiency, but just talking right now about low health literacy. Just like we do with universal precautions, everybody has a blood-borne disease until proven otherwise, and even if proven otherwise, we're going to still treat them as if they did, and that's why we use the red bags, and we use gloves when we draw blood, and we give shots, and we are constantly bond with fluids. Everybody has low health literacy 
tell proven otherwise. You can't tell by looking at them what their understanding of healthcare is, just like I couldn't tell that my African patient had a lot of understanding um, until he made it known. Um, we're just going to assume that everybody has trouble understanding information to take care of their health because it is so overwhelming. I had an experience at one point where I had to get some stitches in an emergency room and the paperwork that I brought home talked about uh, if I had zero sanguineous fluid, it was okay, but if there was purulent discharge, I needed to see a medical provider. And my husband, who's not a healthcare provider, read this and said, wow, this is really confusing. And those were the discharge papers I got from the hospital. So we need to make sure that everybody is given information in the language they can understand and at a level they can understand. And because we can't tell who has low, low health literacy, we recommend a universal precautions approach. That is simple information for everybody. And by simplifying this, we've paved the way for improved communications. Simple signs up in the office. Um, a lot of us have complicated names and languages that our patients don't understand. Having a picture of the providers, and when they want to make their follow-up appointment, they don't have to say, with Dr. When you give a complicated name or with the nurse practitioner, the, the gringa, you know, the one who speaks Spanish, um, they can just have simple pictures. This is from the Arlington Free Clinic in Arlington, Virginia. And so the patients can just say, this is the provider I saw and I would like to see them again. Making sure, again, that the signage is very simple. And then looking at very creative ways to provide education. Um, many people do not learn by reading, do not learn on the internet. We're all focused on having electronic health records and electronic um, health for our patients, um, but often our patients are in a room waiting for 15, 20 minutes, maybe even a half an hour with a computer sitting in that room. Can we pull up low literacy um, videos in a language they understand? I had a patient recently who I was teaching about diabetes and how to use insulin. And so the first thing I did is I had him watch a video that I just found on YouTube, and I said, you watch this video, um, and then we'll come back in, and I'll go over it with you. I wasn't going to have the video be the only teacher, but it's a head start. So remembering that people learn in ways that may not be reading. This is a picture of a, of a puppet that teaches about asthma and what happens during asthma. It's a flannel puppet, so the flannel sticks, and there you have pictures of lungs that, have, that are clear and lungs that are inflamed with asthma. Um, where I live, we have a program called uh, Salud is Vida, where the uh, health promoters go out and provide language um, appropriate education. Again, I mentioned group visits. Can some of those be done by health promoters or lay health workers? Um, finding books that are low literacy that are appropriate. There's a great CD called the Asthma Blues, and it has songs about taking care of your asthma and how to use your inhalers. Um, the, at Northwestern University, uh, on their website, they have great low literacy patient education materials. Um, there's a woman in North Carolina who does photo novellas or little graphic books with pictures for teaching about uh, pregnancy and prenatal care. Um, and so really uh, stretching our brains and not realizing that not everything has to be a written worksheet or something that's very dense. And within that idea, we need to remember that things need to be written with a very simple font, none of these fancy curly fonts, very simple layout, um, one or two key points written in what's called plain language. So if you remember I talked about that meter dose inhaler earlier on, um, I've seen something that comes out from Harvard University called asthma in plain language, and it says if you have asthma, it means that your trachea, and then it says in parentheses windpipe, uh, may be inflamed and um, and it supplements um, uh, lay words with more medical terms. Um, so again, sugar in your blood may be what people call diabetes. I've had patients who say they have the virus. It doesn't mean a, an upper respiratory virus. It means they have HIV. Um, so interspersing people's language with a more um, formal use is really important or something that would teach them like this. Why we're here talks about if you have yellowish skin, and that's jaundice, or you're very large, macrosomia. So they're interspersing the um, medical words with the lay words. Um, and that's a way to bring people from having low health literacy to improving their health literacy. 
again, we really need to think about words that we use. And this is a lovely book, um, which some of you may have called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves, um, versus Eat Shoots and Leaves. Um, and this one talks specifically about commas, but words really do make a difference. Remember I talked about the five milliliters or the five, um, uh, let's say five teaspoons versus five tablespoons. It's really important that we're very clear and that words do matter. And so any forms that your organization is printing out that you're creating can be run um, very cheaply through Word it, on your computer. It'll tell you the reading level and we look strive for sixth grade or below. We know for many people it's even third grade or below. There's something called wordscount.info and you can put in something, um, put a document through and it'll tell you the level. So um, make sure that we've tested our documents both electronically to see what level they're at as well as doing some um, testing in the community. So before something really goes out as the final document, whether it's your appointment slip or your map on how to get to the blood drawing lab, um, making sure that some of the patients can review it is, um, can be helpful. Um, community health workers are ideal people to help bridge this gap because they often understand the needs of the patient population as well as the needs of the medical community. And it's a very good service delivery mechanism where our clinicians can uh, be in communication with community health workers who may be in the home. And they may be in the home looking specifically at indoor asthma triggers or postpartum home visits, but they may be able to realize other things such as food insecurity or safety in the home, or if there's a smoker in the home, or, or this is a crib that still has bumpers up, which have recently been um, uh, pulled because it was found that there was more of a chance of suffocation with bumpers. And those are the kind of things that community health workers, whether they are doing this, um, at a health fair where they can talk to patients or in the home can play a real role. And in fact, in some areas, the community health plans in Massachusetts have used community health workers for asthma education and have improved asthma outcomes and increased ED visits um, for patients with asthma just by the use of the community health workers. So there are so many things that need to fit together. Um, organizations with good communications for clients are usually culturally and linguistically competent. And that means they're looking at this complex issue of limited English proficiency, health literacy, as well as the cultural and, um, aspects of the staff. Is it a diverse staff? Is the staff multilingual? And is the staff getting ongoing training issues around working with a multicultural patient population, starting with self-assessment tools, which are available at some of the places that I referred you to. I thank you, and I would encourage you to um, follow up with me either at the Association of Clinicians for Underserved or with the other great resources that the National Center for Primary Care has at Primary Care for All, um, as well as with the National Center for Cultural Competence. So, Thank you very much, and I hope that you are on the way to making your organization more culturally and linguistically.